Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Daryl Bennett, um, Comeback Swinging. And, uh, you know, I, this is something that I've alluded to since really the past several months, since at least the pandemic began, even before the national unrest. You know, are we living or reliving the book of Exodus? Um, I think that there are so many striking similarities between the story of the exit of the people of God from under an evil, oppressive, unjust, unfair, unequal system and what we're seeing today. It is spectacularly striking, so much so that uh, it makes you think what's happening next. Um, the first thing that I want to say is if you were to have asked the people who were living in the book of Exodus, were they living in the book of Exodus, they would have said no. See, we have the benefit of, of perspective. They didn't. <laughs> they were just living their lives. It was just um, them going about their lives and these things that had occurred. And it is, it is only through perspective that we look and we recognize that things that seem to be unconnected, things that seem to be natural phenomenon, things that seem to just be coincidental and random and surreptitious were actually all done at the behest and the orchestration of, an, of a mighty and just God to deliver his people. There were so many things that were occurring at once that there are some scientific explanations for the plagues, for instance. There are some. And uh, what we find is that there is an amazing, amazing, amazing amount of similarities. And I want to walk you through where we are today and where the people were in Exodus. Hey, how you doing, uh, Isaiah? <laughs> how you doing? Uh, so let me get straight into this. The first thing that I want to share that is quite striking to me, and you, you cannot lose this, um, is that God tells Abraham, your people are going to be in bondage. Your descendants are going to be in bondage for 400 years, but I'm going to deliver them. Now, before COVID, before the unrest, before the bringing down of the statues, before it all became in vogue to say, you know, Black Lives Matter, we know that we celebrated, if celebration is a word, last year, 2019, 400 years since the first Africans who were brought here and chains were brought here. This has been going on. I want you to just think about that for a second. For 400 years. Four hundred years. This has been going on since before the American Constitution was enshrined, before the founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence, before uh, this country even came into existence on this land has been oppression. Now, I want to tell you something. The scripture tells us that when uh, Cain killed Abel and God came to Cain and said, where is Abel? He said, am I your brother's keeper? Am I supposed to be my brother's keeper? And God said, his blood cries out to me from the ground. The blood of African slaves who were brought here and oppressed and tortured and raped and brutalized, their blood cries out from the ground. See, everybody talks about on the flag. Let me get, pull this up. Everybody talks about on the flag, the 50 stars. They don't know the symbolism between the 13 stripes, particularly the seven red. Notice there's more red than white. Well, I'll tell you why. The red symbolizes blood. They'll tell you that. They say the, 13, the 50 stars the, are in 50 states now, the 13 colonies, the 13 stripes, but there's more. The white is supposed to represent peace, but the red represents blood, war. And there are more red stripes than uh, white stripes because it is to signify blood. What they don't tell you is whose blood is it? It's the blood of black people that built this land. And it cries out from the ground. You cannot think a just God. I was just watching last night, and I don't know why I watched this stuff. Because <sighs> I was like, Daryl, you know you're not ready for this. I watched the story, um, 16 shots 
of how they killed that, murdered that boy out in Chicago. And the police co tried to cover it up. They did end up charging him with murder. He was convicted. And then the judge came back and said, well, but, you know, you get a couple years. And I went to bed. I went to bed angry. Like, God, I know we're not supposed to question you in this way. And who is man to question the God of the universe? But God, why have you allowed this injustice to last for this long? The Bible says in Revelations that there comes a time where the saints of God say, how much longer will our blood not be avenged? And he says, yet a little while and I will perform the work. It says it in Revelations. And we make it so religious that this blood of saints is, is, is just the blood of holy people. We're talking about the blood of people who were brought to this land unjustly. And it cries from the ground. This has been going on for 400 years. So that's the first thing. I don't want to stop on that point. That's the first similarity that you cannot miss. And I, and I want to say this here now. People get me because they talk about, well, you know, there's other people who've been enslaved in other countries. Not for 400 years. <laughs> people have had moments and blips where it's been a couple years and 20 years and a generation. And there have been, and, and, and I want to be careful, I say this, there have been uh, systematic oppression of people. No question, it's happened all over the world. But it happens in a generation. It happens in two generations. America is standalone. There is no, I want to be very clear about this. There is nothing no precedent in the history of the world for what transatlantic slavery was. There's no precedent for it. There's no precedent, first of all, that slavery, that they were considered chattel as opposed to people. There's no precedent for that. In fact, we know in many times when people call slaves, they were really saying servant. That's where indentured servitude comes from. The serfs, for instance, in Russia. It was no precedent for treating people as, for branding them, saying that they had no rights. There was no precedent for taking a people across an ocean. Can you imagine that? You, I went to college and I felt like I had a little bit of trauma because I went from Virginia to Atlanta and I'm like, I don't know where I am. Can you imagine being plucked from a continent? Your land, your heritage, your people, everything you know, you've come to, and, and you come to this land and it, denigrates the history of my people to play like, well, this has been going on all over the world since the beginning of time. No, it has not. And historically, if you show me differently, I'll come on here and apologize to all the people on my platform. You show me ever in the history of the world where there's been another people that's been taken out of their land across an ocean to an entirely different continent. Split up all over the, the Western continent. And this isn't just African Americans. I'm talking about black people who were sent to Jamaica and sent to Haiti and, and, and sent to the Dominican Republic and sent to South America. They say that the slave trade was so disruptive on the ocean that it changed the pattern of sharks to this day. Because they were throwing so many people overboard, the shark patterns changed to follow the exact pattern of the way the ships were coming in. Don't play with me and act like this has been going on for hundreds of years and thousands of years all over the world. It's no precedent for it. So that's the first similarity. 400 years. Now you might say, but Daryl, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed 200 some years ago. The characters changed, the plot did not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because what was chattel slavery turned into Jim Crow. It was still a system that said, we refuse to see you as equal. We refuse to see the sanctity of your life. We refuse to give you basic liberties and basic rights. Forget the right to vote. We'll talk about that later. The right to live, the right to exist. We're still fighting for that now. We're still fighting that Jim Crow's been taken off and now you're dealing with police brutality. You're dealing with so many women who have black boys in this country who are scared every time they walk out the door. Because you want to talk about, well, uh, uh, well, what's going to, you know, uh, black, I don't even want to talk about that because people get me with this whole black on black violence. Don't even play with me with that. You want to talk about the amount of distress and trauma that has been thrown in our communities and then you wonder why we see what we're seeing? And so we're fighting for the right to exist. 
Yes, it manifests as bring down the statues and it manifests as we don't think that these memorials should be here. But at the core of it, it's a fight to exist. It's a fight to say, can I just have due process of law like the next person? And so, scripture tells us that when Moses was born, the Pharaoh had instituted something long before Moses came about, but around this time was when it became even more, uh, uh, more of a, a systematic thing. They said, let's kill all the Israelite boys. See, because there's an attack against the boys. D don't get me wrong. The women are oppressed too, but it's the young boys that are always really oppressed. We're seeing that in this country now. We're seeing that in this country. It's the same thing. And so what the Pharaoh said is, kill them before they have a chance to grow up. It's still happening today. COVID exposed what was already the case. That we have a healthcare system that's not just unequal, it's racially biased. That's why statistically, you cannot argue with statistics. Statistically, black women are much more likely to die in childbirth. Why is that? Statistically, black boys are much more likely to end up on medication that, de that, that, that causes them to end up being in zombie-like states and in some cases leads them right to drug abuse. Why is that? Because you have a healthcare system that's not just complicit, but it is partly orchestrating the orders of an evil, unjust hierarchy. It's happening today. I want you to see the book of Exodus didn't just pass away. It's being relived now. And so God puts in the heart of Moses and he tells Moses, I've seen the affliction, I've heard the cry, I've watched the oppression, and I've come to deliver my people. Now he warns Moses, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Because Pharaoh is not going to listen. He tells Moses, I'm going to tell you what to tell Pharaoh, and I'm also going to tell you he's not going to listen. Because Pharaoh is an evil man who is led by the satanic spirit of division and hate, who will use every tool, mechanism, and resource at his disposal to keep people oppressed. That's where we are in America today. I'm not going to play. I'm not going to mince words. I'm not going to act like this is a Democrat or Republican issue. Anybody that knows me knows I was the one that stood and, and people may not like it, but I was the one that said I thought George Bush was the best thing that happened to this country during September 11th. I was the one that said I voted for Republicans and I voted for Democrats. I stood behind Bush and I stood behind Obama. This is bigger than a political issue. This man who is in the White House today threatens to destroy the very fabric that is America. I'm not going to sit around here and play like it's anything other than that. You can act like it's a political issue. It's a human rights issue. We've never had a president in modern history that would stand up in the middle of all this unrest and say, shoot him dead. And he cares nothing about the police officers. I was having a summit with police officers, the NYPD, not long ago. And I said, you can't think he cares anything about you because when the shooting starts, people die on both sides. A Pharaoh who refuses to listen to the word of God. That's where we are now. You use the United States military to clear out people with tear gas so you can stand in front of the church with a photo op and hold a Bible that you probably never cracked open. I'm not going to play this game. we got to start talking truth. We have to stop playing like, well, you know, this is just one person. And that's the other thing that I want to say. This is bigger than this person that's in the White House. It's bigger than him. It is a system that he's upholding. You think 400 years of oppression in Egypt could have happened if it was just the Pharaoh that was on board? No, no, no. Egypt doesn't get off that easily. It was systems in place. They were taskmasters. Every system in Egypt would have been complicit if not outright in condonation of what was going on. The educational system. See, we don't talk about that. We make it all about Moses versus Pharaoh. It was bigger than that. 
The educational systems would have been complicit in this. The financial systems in Egypt would have been complicit in this. The cultural systems, every system in Egypt was complicit in what created and exacerbated and perpetuated centuries of oppression. So no, Egypt doesn't get a pass just because they had an evil pharaoh. He just made it worse. It was a lot of people, presumably, that felt like because they didn't happen so long, well, it's just our lot in life that the Hebrews will serve us. They've built our cities. They've built our lands. They've, 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 they've built our monuments. Some monuments, because mind you, we're told, this is, this, is, this is another analogy. We're told that the children of Israel were made to build the city of Ramesses. Ramesses, the same man who was oppressing them. How many times have black people in this country been made to build? You want to talk about, we don't want to take them down. Who do you think built them? Who do you think built the same monuments to these people that were oppressing them? And so, God tells Moses, I am going to judge Egypt with great judgments. That's the word. Read it in Exodus. I'm not just coming to judge Pharaoh. It's bigger than Pharaoh. I'm not just coming to judge a couple police officers that did the wrong thing. It's bigger than that. I'm not just coming to judge a few people who got caught on camera doing wrong. I've come to judge a nation because you stood by and watched oppression. You stood by and said, well, that's them. Who the hell cares about them? They're supposed to serve us. We're Egyptians. They're Hebrews. We're us. They're them. And so God said, I'm going to judge a nation. And he tells Moses, when this thing is said and done, all people will know that I'm God. Oh, it's going to get worse first. And Pharaoh's going to say no. And he's going to pull out all the stops. And it's going to be a lot of things that happen. But Moses, take heart. I am with you. I am here. I am going to deliver. And I'm going to make sure that before it's all said and done, the whole nation knows I'm God. You don't get to play God. You don't get to set up your own monuments and you set up your own idols and you set up your own religious systems and you've worshipped what you've said was God. But he said, I've come to tell you who I really am. You've worshipped idols, America. You've worshipped whiteness, America. You've worshipped this sense that God is in your religious, your religiosity and your your, 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 your sense of racial supremacy. And the true God said, I've come to, to, to disavow you of that. I've come to divorce you from your sense of who you thought that I was. And so what happens? The book of Exodus in the beginning really is a story about all of these things that happened to Egypt. One, because of a history of oppression. And two, because of a pharaoh that refuses to honor God. This is how gracious God is. I want you to see this. I want you to catch this. God is so gracious that he kept giving pharaoh chances to get it right. Most people don't know. But when you read the scriptures carefully, we're told that when Moses first went to pharaoh, he did not ask for them to be freed. He never asked that. Not freed in the way that we understand free. He said, the Lord, our God, has come to us and said, come and worship for three days. He asked Pharaoh, essentially, for a three-day church trip to the wilderness to take his people to sacrifice. And Pharaoh said, if you have time for three days to sacrifice to your God, then you have time. You obviously have too much time on your hands. So he says, not only do I not know the Lord your God, not only will I not let the people go, but I will make them to make more bricks. And I'm taking away the straw. And what we find is that the children of Israel were angry at Moses because they said, you made it worse for us. See, some people are angry at the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm talking about in the black community because they're like, you made it worse. They haven't made it worse. If anything, they call out what been, we've been dealing with for all of this time. You cannot get mad at the backlash, 
of people who don't want to hear about the cry of justice. They did it to Moses. They told Moses it would have been better if you would have just stayed in the wilderness. Because even though we were oppressed, we were comfortable. It's an analogy here, people. We've been oppressed and we're comfortable. Because so many of us are happy that we're just happy to just be able to work in their institutions. And we're happy to just be able to go to their schools. And we're happy to just be able to get a little bit of recognition, even though you may never own the company. Even though you may never be the, the face of the network. Even though you may never own the sports team. It's good enough that we just have a piece and a parcel. And so when people come by and agitate and say, wait a minute. Why is it that we, all of our people are, that are in the NBA are the ones running around. And none of them are the owners. And so they say, well, if that's the case, then we'll stop letting some of them in. Then people say, well, you made it worse for us before you made it better. They were so angry at Colin Kaepernick that despite all of his talent, they said, this Negro, we, over our dead bodies, will we ever let him get a contract again? I want you to see what hate looks like. It's not just the devil in the red horns that's running around with fire coming out of his breath. I want you to see what true hate looks like. That even this man with great talent, you're that angry. Why? Because he knelt in a free country, supposedly. He knelt during the national anthem. But where is that anger for the man that knelt on somebody's neck? Nothing to say about that. And now you come out and say, well, we apologize for what we did. Give him his job back. Give him a contract. Let the man have a livelihood again. What they did to him was absolutely horrible. You wonder why I don't watch any sports on the NFL at all for that reason. Stop supporting these systems that are destroying your people. I don't care how good, I don't care how entertaining it is. You want to know how to bring that stuff down? Stop watching it. Stop supporting it. Stop supporting these systems that continually want to see you in the underclass position. Why aren't we owners? Don't just give Colin Kaepernick a job back. Let him own something. Let us begin to be in the seat of power where we can start to make systematic change. And they told Moses, they said, oh, 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 heck no. <laughs> you have made it worse for us. <laughs> because when there's change that's coming there will always be people on the other side of change that will do everything they can to stop it it's what hate looks like I want you to know what it looks like they can smile in your face and they can say all the nice words and they might even have a scripture for you but at the end of the day you know it when you see it because it's a, a refusal to heed the call of justice a refusal an outright refusal that even though, even if we lose money, even if he's our star athlete, we'd rather lose money than allow him to take a stand that could later cause the rest of us as owners to diminish our influence. Because if other people think like he thinks, what's the next step? That's exactly what was going on in Egypt. That even though when the plague started and it was destroying the economy and it was destroying their livelihood, it was still a system in place that said it would be better for us to allow the economy to be destroyed and allow unemployment to, to skyrocket and allow all of these things to happen to spite our own face. It's rather for us to do that than to embrace change. That's what hate looks like. And so God began to bring plagues. Now, I've watched a lot of shows, and I'm sure you have. I've read a lot of research, and I'm sure many of you have, that they try to give explanations, natural explanations for what happened. You know, the blood in the river, the, the lice, and all this other stuff. The Bible, first of all, never says it was blood in the river. It said that it was, it was, the, it was well, the way that it's described, it was the color of blood. And some say, well, it was the algae that was kicked up. And they say, well, because the algae came up in the smell, it would have killed the frogs. And that's why the frogs died. And then the flies came as a result. And so, yes, I think that there are scientific explanations for a lot of it. But understand, who do, who's behind science? It is the God of heaven. You cannot think that all of these things that are happening now are coincidental. COVID came first. A pandemic that shut everything down. I would dare to say that where we are as a racial awakening in this country would never have happened without COVID. Everybody would have still been working. Everybody would have been too busy doing what they were doing. But it took a perfect storm, a confluence of events to happen to bring us to this place. We had a bunch of people home ticked off and angry. Watching 
how money got divvied out to all of the billionaires. And hardly any of it touched the hands of the people that built the companies that made the billionaires billionaires. See, we're talking about systems here. We're talking about systems. We're talking about this, this, you use the American economy and you printed money to give money to your billionaire friends. And now more and more and more is coming out to show, oh, this money that really, the, 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 the trillions, because they, they borrow trillions. The trillions, or, or they, uh, um, excuse me, they, I don't want to say borrow, they assign trillions. The mass amount of that money went to the people who, in some cases, created the economic situation that we're in today. And people had time to sit at home and think about that. They had time to sit at home. The people that you call essential workers that you may go to work in the midst of it, they're essential, but yet their pay doesn't show that they're essential. Their benefits don't show that they're essential. And people have said, well, you know, people who are black and Hispanic in this country end up having COVID at higher rates. Duh, because these were the ones that had to still go to work for the most part. These were the ones that still had to get in the subway. These were the ones that still had to brave the, 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 the storm and all of the things that were going on and, 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 and put their lives and their families' lives at risk so that way they could still make a living wage. And people had time to think about all that. So when George Floyd happened, yes, people would tick the heck off. Yeah, because people were thinking about, wait a minute, we've fought for centuries to be at a place where it looks like not too much has changed. Where economic, educational, healthcare systems are still all stacked against an entire people. And so you had COVID and then you had George Floyd. And then you had the riots, then you had the unrest, and then you had more of the COVID happen. You have all these things that are happening. And I want you to understand that if you were to backtrack 4,000 some years and you were to plant yourself in the middle of Egypt when the lice and the, and the boils happened and the cattle were dying and the darkness happened, there would have been scientists that had reasons for why it was happening. And CNN could have given explanations and pontificators would have pontificated as to what was going on. But there was somebody, there was an old church mother who would have said, this is the orchestration of God. This didn't just happen. Talking about now giant hornets and dust coming from Sahara. And now they're saying that we're going to have the worst hurricane season that we've ever had in the last 10 years. God is calling America to a place of judgment. The blood of people have cried out from the land. And it ain't just black people. I didn't even get to the fact that we displaced an entire race of Native Americans. I don't know if y'all saw that case that just came down from the Supreme Court yesterday that just said that... Um, over half of Oklahoma should be reservation land. I don't know if you saw the outcry that happened right after uh, uh, the, the, that man in the White House uh, stoked the fires of racism over in Tulsa and said we're going to have a rally on June 19th uh, uh, or Juneteenth in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the, the site of the worst black massacre since uh, uh, the Civil War. Then he turned around and said we're going to Mount Rushmore. And the Native Americans said we've been fighting for the longest because that was built on our native land. That was built on sacred land. It's not just us. I want you to understand. It's not just black people who have been oppressed and whose blood is crying out from the land. You killed millions of Native Americans and then you took the rest and you threw them on reservations. And you think that God, a just God, there's not a recompense for that? You wanted a recompense for September 11th. They took two of your buildings. And everybody was screaming, God is going to judge the Israeli, I mean, the, the Arab people for that. You, you said he was going to judge a whole Arab, a whole nation for something that a couple people did in a plane. Imagine how you would feel seeing your whole entire people systematically oppressed. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. This is, this is at the behest and the orchestration of God. Now, I want to be very clear. I want to be very clear about this. Nothing that happens is by accident. Nothing happens by accident. So we've got the 400 years, that's a parallel. You've got all of these seemingly weird things and plagues that have come out of nowhere. That's another thing. And understand, I want you to know the practical effect of what it did between the locusts, the lice, the, 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 the boils on the skin, all of the stuff that happened in, Israel, in Egypt as a result, it totally destroyed their economy. 
We know historically that Egypt never became the empire that it was after that. All because they refused to listen to the call of justice. It got worse and worse and worse. It completely destroyed their economy. Completely destroyed their economy. You see the similarities? And then there was a pharaoh who knew God not, refused to know God, refused to heed the call of God, and, and actually said pretty much within himself, I'll continue to do what I'm going to do regardless, even if it's destroying my nation. I want you to know what hate looks like. Even though he recognizes a pharaoh, it was destroying his nation, he still said, I won't let him go. This is how bad it got. All of the plagues, the lice, the flies, the rivers being turned to color of blood, the frogs, the boils on the skin, the cattle dying, the locusts, the darkness over the face of all of Egypt, and uh, I'm sure I'm missing one, but there were nine of them that happened. Then comes the plague where the angel of death comes over the entire land and the firstborn of every child is killed. So now we see not only the economies being destroyed, but people are mysteriously dying. Nobody ever says what that angel of death was. For all we know, it came in the form of a plague. For all we know, it came in the form of a mist. We don't know. But all we know is that people started dropping like flies. Even after all that, it was the ministers of Pharaoh that came to Pharaoh and said, let them go. We won't even have a country to hold on to. That's how angry he was. I want you to know what hate looks like. He's, he, even at the crumbling of the nation that was around him, he said, I still refuse to let them go. Because when people have been serving you and you have a, 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 your foot on their neck, it's sometimes nothing will take it off. It will take you breaking that person's leg or them dying before the, the foot is taken off. That's what real hate looks like. I want you to know what it looks like so we're not playing around at the fringes and we act like this is a political issue. It's hate. It's hate at the core of it. And so then we're told this is one of my favorite parts. That the children of Israel begin to leave because now they've been given the clearance by Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, you got to leave and you got to leave right now. It was his ministers that pushed him to do it. It was the fact that he's looking over his land, his country, his economy has destroyed everything. And he says, leave my presence. And he tells Moses, the day you and me see you see my face again, you're going to surely die. And so the people make haste to leave. And God tells Moses, tell the people to borrow silver and gold from their neighbors. And their neighbors gave them silver and gold as they left. I want you to know why that's important. One, because it signifies that God is a God that will not have you leave empty handed. You didn't build that country and then you just leave empty handed. Secondly, it shows the guilty conscience of the people of Egypt that realized that we were complicit in this. That some of the silver and gold that we have personally in our house is because of the oppression of those people. People get me with that when they talk about, I built this business. Oh, you did. You built it from your father's money. Who got it from his father? Who got it? How do you think? How do you think? Did it benefit from some sort of privilege? Was it because they own people at some time? Like, I'm not mad at you because you built the business, but recognize that all of your success wasn't just you. The oppression of people is what put the gold and silver in your house. And so God tells them, go tell them, I want to borrow that. Borrow. It's a loose term. You're not getting it back. I, I'm going to borrow that. I need that. And so as they leave, it's this little scripture that tells us, we don't talk about it often. It's a little scripture that says that a mixed multitude went out with them. What does that mean? There were some Egyptians that went out with the children of Egypt, of Israel. There were some Egyptians that said, we got to go. Because they looked up and they realized, oh my gosh. It ain't nothing left here. Because they realized that the same God that had come to deliver his people, it was, it was a mighty and it was a powerful and it was an awesome and awful God. And they said, we'd rather be on the side of justice than be on the side of what we, know that we, we think to be true. So an entire group of people leave. And you would think that would be it. 
the country of Egypt is destroyed. The firstborn of all the land has died. Egypt is in, pretty much is in shambles. And I'm going to tell you something about what hate really looks like. It is a refusal to see people be free. Because Pharaoh got up at night, and the scripture tells us that Pharaoh said to his ministers, what the heck have we done? <laughs> and he summoned the military. I want you to see what's the, the analogy. He summoned the military and said, now we're going to go bring them back. Because it's so sad that people just don't know when to cut their losses. He was so distraught, not that his own son lay dead, not that the heir to the throne of Egypt in a dynasty that we know would have already been ruling for over a century, not that the heir to his own throne was dead. That wasn't what kept them up at night. What kept this man up at night was we actually let those people be free. That's what hate looks like. It's not a concern. You can wrap it around and act like people are concerned about the Confederate memorials. He put together a task force. He's not concerned about those memorials. Are you kidding? It's about using any tool, way, or feature to divide people. And so the Pharaoh says, we got to get them back. This, uh-uh. Uh-uh. Because it's, it's, it's better to be poor and have a slave than it is to be rich and see people free. That's really what his thinking was. And so he summons the military and they chase after the people of God. Because I want you to know something. There will always be people who will do everything they can to try to stop you from being free. Even at the last moment. The 16 shots the show that I told you I watched, and I would encourage you to watch it, where I forget the last name, but Laquan, where that police officer shot this boy. He was a, he was a boy. He was a minor. Shot this boy 16 times because they said he felt that he was in fear. And they said that Chicago had never brought charges against anybody ever in the history of that city against a police officer that shot a, a black man or a black boy. They brought these unprecedented charges of second degree murder. The jury actually, who was mostly white, convicted this man of not only second degree murder, but 16 counts of aggravated battery based on one of every single shot that he shot. And each count for each shot was six to 30 years in prison. The judge looked at the whole thing because the judge got the decision to make the sentence. He was convicted. He was looking at, even the one person said, what's 30 times 16? Yeah, he'll be in there for the rest of his life. The judge said, you get, I think it was a six year sentence and after two years, he was eligible for release. I want you to see what hate looks like. I want you to know it. It's a refusal that they said as a system that even if you get a guilty plea, we'll still on the back end run free. We'll still find a way because we will not see you be free unless and until you fight for it. People get me with that. People act like we can just sit back and wait and that people are going to come to their senses and do the right thing. And this is what we see, that people on the back end, how many people got released from prison because of COVID that, that didn't look like me? So, so let me get this straight. You're all in prison together. Everybody presumably is dealing with the same threat. But yet you're able to put in a petition that says pretty much I can't be in here with these people because my life is more valuable. And you sign off and let these people free. But you, you say they're still in the custody of the state. They're just serving their sentence at home. <laughs> but this, this, is, this, is, this, is what, this is this is what people do. It's a refusal to let people go. So coming to a close, you know the climax of the story. The children of Israel are looking at the river in front of them, excuse me, the ocean in front of them, and the, and the, um, the army of Pharaoh behind them. And they go through the Red Sea, and the entire army that chased them drowned. But this is the point that I want to get to. What is the promised land 
for people look like today. I don't know if it looks like us leaving America. We built this country. So if anything, other folk are going to have to leave. No, we're not going nowhere. We, we're here now. We're here now. So we're not talking about a physical exodus. I don't think. I don't believe anyway. What we're talking about is a spiritual exodus. An exit from a system that has traditionally refused to heed the call of justice. We're talking about an exit from an age of complicity. I've spoken a lot about that recently because it's bothersome to me. The complicity. Complicity from systems of business, systems in finance, systems in education, systems in religion. That have watched this whole thing happen for hundreds of years, but have nibbled around and talked around the edges. They have preached servants be obedient to your masters as somehow a way to suggest, imply, and insert, assert that slavery and the degradation of humans and the splitting up of families and the raping of our women and the torture of our children was justified by God. And now we've come to a place where we've got to deal with it. And so this exit that is happening, it is an exit. It is a change. Oh, we, this, it's no going back. It is a change. It is certainly a change. How it looks, how it manifests, what this looks like two, three, four, five years from now, I don't know. But I can tell you what, the game has been changed. And so now we're at a place and we're at a time where I believe for America to succeed. America has to heed the call for justice. America has to heed the call of God. You cannot keep doing what you've been doing. I mean, for crying out loud, you've done it long enough. And I mean, when, it, when do you call a win a win? <laughs> I mean, you, you can't win at Vegas the whole time. If you had a, you know, a, a, a three-week streak, you take your money and you leave and you'd be happy with it. You don't get angry that now the streak has ended. It's been 400 years of oppression. Yeah, eventually people are going to rise up. Yup, and we're taking down the statues. Yup, and we're burning the monuments. Yup, we're getting rid of the museums. And if you keep playing, there's going to be a lot of other stuff that gets destroyed in the wake. It's gonna be a lot. This is just the beginning. This is where I want to close. America... We call ourselves a, I was going to say you, but I'm going to say we because I am an American. We call ourselves a Christian nation. But what does that mean? I don't think Pharaoh called himself a Christian, so I won't make the analogy there. But Pharaoh did believe he served a God. He, you know, the Egyptians were very religious people. They worshipped all kinds of gods. I believe in this country we're more religious than we are followers of Christ anyway. But that's a whole other thing. But if you really are a Christian nation, if we really say that we espouse the cause of justice and freedom for all, if we really hold up this banner that we went to Iraq to free the Iraqi people from the tyranny of Saddam Hussein, was, who was oppressing his people for 30 years. Can we talk about a system over here that's been oppressing people for 300 plus years? If you are really a Christian nation, this is the time to show it. You cannot think that a just God, a God of righteousness, is pleased with the history of this nation. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to know the raping of women systematically is wrong. The torturing of people is wrong. The splitting up of families that was done for so long, it's wrong. The mass incarceration where you will incarcerate some people and give other people a slap on the wrist for the same exact offense, it's wrong. I don't want to play around with it. It's wrong. And until and unless we recognize that it's wrong and we turn, 
the country that you say you love. So I'm not going to say I love this country anymore. I like it. I'm glad to have been born here. But I love God. I love my people. I love the people of God. But I'm not going to say that I love this country the way that it has turned out. But you say you love this country. You say God bless America. So if that's the case, heed the call. Thank you for listening. My name is Daryl Bennett.